Okay, today I'm going to try to make a video talking about the theory behind NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. A really, 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 really useful technique used in organic chemistry to identify molecules and used in medicine, MRI, to image tissues. Um, so to start, we need to think about the name. NMR, it's nuclear magnetic resonance, and so let's start by talking about nuclear or nuclear depending on who you are. Anyway, um, so we're going to look at atomic nuclei, and that's the essence of this type of spectroscopy. And nuclei of atoms are made of protons, a mixture of protons and neutrons. And it turns out these particles have spin. They spin. Why they spin? I don't know why they spin, but they do spin. And in a lot of atoms, the combination of protons and neutrons within the nucleus imparts an overall net spin to the nucleus. So we can think of a nucleus as sort of a ball of protons and maybe some neutrons in there, and it's spinning. And if you remember any physics, the spin on that molecule can impart uh, a magnetic field, or um, and we might think of the right-hand rule. Okay. Now, it turns out that in a molecule, the nuclei of atoms in that molecule are spinning, and they're spinning in all sorts of directions. Here, I've got this nail put into the top of the ball, which is describing the um, electromagnetic field generated by these nuclei, and, you know, there could be some in a molecule going left, some right, some up, some down, and it's just chaotic, right? Now, we're going to impose some order on that chaos, and how we're going to do it is by applying a magnetic field. And under the influence of an external magnetic field, these nuclei, these spinning nuclei, will act like little magnets, and really they'll choose to do one of two things. Either they will align with the magnetic field, go in the same direction as it, or they will go in complete opposition to it. And the analogy I like to use is sort of fish, right? If these nuclei are fish, they're, and you put them in a pond, really the fish can swim however they want to. There's no reason for them to do one thing or the other. But if you put them in a current, in a river, really there's only two stable things that those fish can do. Either they can swim with the current, or they can swim in total opposition to the current, completely against the current. Those are two stable things they can do. If they sort of choose to do something else, they're going to get bashed into the side of the bank. That's not what they want to do. So in uh, external magnetic field, just like a current, these nuclei will either align with the current, uh, or with, sorry, with the magnetic field, or against the magnetic field, and there's a slight majority of nuclei, understandably, which align with the magnetic field, which is lower in energy. Okay, now these nuclei are still spinning, and it turns out in the presence of a magnetic field, they will do something that is called precession and really it's a type of wobble. Now what I'm going to do is spin this ball on the desktop here, and I'm going to do it in the presence of a gravitational field, the gravity, and what we'll be able to see is this wobble. Okay, so let me, let me try this. So here we go. Here's the ball. I'm going to spin it, and you can see it wobbling. Let's do that again. Okay. Hopefully, you could see the, the um, nail on the top sort of wobbling around, and this is called precession. You see it with tops, you see it with gyroscopes, and really this wobble, this precession, has a particular frequency. And the frequency of precession depends on a lot of different things. So it depends on how much magnetic field we've applied, it depends on how big this ad or this nucleus is, and it depends on how fast it's spinning. But since each nuclei has a particular frequency of precession, what it means is we can actually bombard these nuclei with electromagnetic radiation. It turns out like TV waves, UHF, VHF frequencies, and if we match the frequency at which they're processing, these nuclei can absorb that energy. And when they absorb that energy, they resonate. Okay, They absorb that energy and they do something with it. Okay. Now, if we have a nucleus that is opposed to the electromagnetic field, it's precessing at a particular frequency, wobbling. 
If we bombard that nucleus with electromagnetic radiation that matches that frequency, it can absorb that light and flip. That's the idea of the resonance, okay? The last letter in the NMR. Now, as it absorbed that energy, we can detect that as a signal. And so NMR is a great tool for observing nuclei in a molecule and really probing how fast they are wobbling or precessing. And since each nucleus in a molecule has the potential to be precessing at a different frequency, we have the ability to define how many different types of nuclei are present in a molecule. Differ by whether they are a hydrogen atom, a carbon atom, and really we can look at what their electronic environment is, whether they're very shielded by electrons or de-shielded, don't have much electron density around them, because those things will determine how fast they are precessing or wobbling. Really, NMR is a great tool, and we can think of it as a way of detecting nuclei. And really, it's by making them sing, making them resonate. If you've ever done this with a glass, what I'm doing is I'm asking, I'm spinning the thing, right? I'm spinning at a particular frequency. Now, when I hit that magical frequency that this glass likes, it will resonate and sing to me. And that's exactly what we're doing with NMR, is we are asking them to spin, and we're listening to them sing by seeing at what frequency they can resonate.